The act of obtaining and using drugs can lead you down the rabbit hole to some serious horror. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. I'm not one to ever pass up an opportunity for some good deal on high quality cannabis. So when I received a text from a friend of mine, telling me that he could sell me a quarter ounce of some good shit for $25, I jumped at the chance. He led me on all day, telling me that he would be dropping it off in the evening. Evening came, and so did the text saying that he would drop it off later that night. And finally, at 11.30, I received a text that sent a ping of anxiety running through me. Sup man, I'm heading out of town for the night. Your sack is in the garage under the ladder. I knew exactly what this entailed. I was to walk the five blocks to his residence, a mutual friend's house, where he lived in the loft in a garage, slip in unnoticed by the neighbours, search until I found it, leave the money, and be on my merry way. Simple, right? Nope. Wrong. The walk started off sketchy enough, with the lone streetlights on the block going out as I left plunging me into this unnatural pseudo-darkness. I walked along in silence, the only sound coming from the highway some distance away. I'd walked this way before, even at this hour, but I still couldn't shake the anticipation in my gut. I reached the house, which I must say was absolutely terrifying at night. Something didn't seem right. My friend is very strict with his bedtimes. That meant that the house was dark at exactly 10pm each night. Tonight though, there was a glow coming from the first floor. This could have been a number of things. Maybe he had other friends over, bought a girl home, getting a late night snack. I quickly reassured myself as I stepped through the door and into the pitch black garage. I closed the door behind me and got searching. The garage is separated into an upstairs and a downstairs to save space. Upstairs there is a washer and a dryer, whilst downstairs were storage boxes that lend under the stairs forming a cave-like lair. I'm not going to lie, it felt like a robbery simulator, rummaging through my friend's garage unannounced looking for drugs. My heart began to race at the thought, it really started racing though, when I heard the heavy footsteps stomping their way towards the inside garage entrance. I had kicked a can of paint over by accident, so they probably heard it. Now my first instinct told me that I should make myself known. It was my friend's place after all. He probably even knew about the whole deal. We'd laugh, he'd point out where it was, and I'd be on my merry way. That's when I noticed something. My friend does not own a single pair of boots. In a split instant, I had ducked down under the floorboards behind some boxes. The door outside was quite far away, and the footsteps quickly approaching, so escape was not an option. I had to hide it out. I was so confused. I felt as if I were in a slasher movie, hand over my mouth to keep me from hyperventilating and everything. I listened as the door slammed open, the footsteps creaking slowly along the floorboards, just inches to my right. They paced around the garage for what seemed like an age, grunting and taking heavy, laboured breaths. They stopped at the top of the stairs, never making their way down though, and soon enough they made their way back into the house, slamming the door behind them. As soon as the door clicked, I bolted, and I didn't stop running until I was backed home tucked away in bed, with every single light on in the house for the rest of the night. I wasn't able to get the cops involved in the situation, lest they go searching and get my friend in trouble. So I simply sent him a text message and went to sleep. I awoke to two text messages in the morning. 
The first was a message from my dealer friend asking me if I was alright. The second was a text from the friend who owned the house, telling me he got stuck at my friend's overnight, and I was so confused. Later on that day, the friend with the house sent me a link to news over Facebook with no caption. It was a news report about a burglary murder that took place on my friend's street. Two houses had already been confirmed as being broken into in the middle of the night. The first was the home of an injured veteran. He was found in his bedroom with a 9mm slug lodged in his head and all the valuables in his house gone. The second house was my friend's. Number 2 I bought a hundred 2mg Xanax bars, planning to use one a day and taking a few days break quite often. I received them in the post, popped one, and then because I had no tolerance, my barred out self decided to take another, and another, and another. I ended up taking all a hundred in six days, and ordered another 25 at some point during that time. On day 6, I bought myself a gram of coke, and snorted that line by line, and stayed up all night. I got on a bus the morning after, and had a seizure, and ended up in hospital for the day. When I got released, when I came home, I found not only the next Xanax pack, but a gram of heroin as well. I popped another bar, and smoked some heroin. I had no opiate tolerance whatsoever. I overdosed, and was lying there unconscious for around 22 hours. At the end, the woman staying in the room next door heard me breathing weirdly through the walls, and came in and called an ambulance. I was brought back to hospital, and my heart stopped seconds after the paramedics found me. I was hit with narsin three times and defibrillated which restored my heartbeat. I ended up on life support for 45 hours, and my parents were told that at the 24 hour point, that if I didn't wake up in the next 24 hours, they would have to decide to pull the plug. Luckily, somehow, with three hours to spare I woke up, and had caught some form of pneumonia, and was an IV liquid antibiotics for days and then had to take pill antibiotics for days and days afterwards. I was also on an oxygen mask and a nebulizer for a while. Thankfully, that was a massive wake-up call for me, and I'm doing a lot better now. Number 3 Over a year ago, I had a really bad addiction to heroin, cocaine and Xanax way barred out on my way to the ATM for some drug money and forgot my debit card, so I hauled ass back to my apartment so I wouldn't be late for my dealer. I don't really remember the next part of running a four-way stop and crashing my car into a parked church bus. I woke up to ambulances and cops pulling me out of my car, so I hid some drug paraphernalia before they got to me. I bullshitted some story about dropping my sunglasses and bending down to pick them up. Cops only gave me a ticket for an expired registration. I rode in a tow truck home and got a cut on my nose from the airbag and bruised or cracked ribs, which really sucked balls for a few months. Taught me my lesson though. Number 4 As a humanist, I try to look for opportunities to help my fellow human, to being a living front of kindness and compassion, hopefully leaving the world nicer than when I found it. There is a thin line between kindness and naivety though. I also learnt this the hard way. Three or four years ago I was 24 years old. I am a female, recently single and living happily alone. I left work at around 3am, the joys of the service industry, and happened to give a ride home to the co-worker who closed with me. It wasn't a bad part of town per se, 
but not the greatest. Whatever. Time to head home and get me some sleep. Patiently waiting at the red light, streets are void of cars and people. It's 3am of course. When I noticed a man and woman stumbling down the sidewalk to my right. The man knocks on my car window and I flinch. My car doesn't have electronic anything and my window was already down an inch. Maybe they needed help or something. Why else would they be staggering around at 3am? Her ankle is broken, she can't walk. The lady is kind of swaying just out of my view, moaning either in pain or inebriation. I frown. I can call you someone if you like. There's a gas station over there. Maybe you could... The guy then opened my front passenger door, which my co-worker hadn't locked, and the woman stranger stepped into my car. It happened so fast. I was stunned. Even more so when the guy squeezed in beside her. Two people somehow, sitting in the front seat of my Toyota Corolla. I was suddenly conscious of the woman's leg pressing against my purse at her feet. Inside was my phone, my Kindle, and my wallet. With all the hard-earned money that I'd made in the past two weeks of waiting tables, which was my rent and more. They reeked of alcohol with their eyes glazed. They are high as hell, and the guy tells me, You're gonna drive us to the Kruger. Y you mean the Walmart up the street? Drive! Just drive! Uh, okay, I stammered, and complied. Were they armed? I didn't want to find out. The guy was drinking something out of a bottle in a brown paper bag, like a class act. What would they do if I refused? They were clearly in an altered state. Unpredictable. Dangerous. Don't escalate. Don't provoke. I pressed my lips into a forced smile and decided that I would be as calm as possible and polite as I could possibly manage. And maybe they'd have second thoughts about murdering someone so nice or at least feel a little bad about it. They tried to engage me in conversation as we drove. The woman seemed to be about 40, leathery skin, and quite manic. She would rattle off schizophrenic nonsense one minute, and then become incredibly lucid and well-spoken in a complex topic, like computer science. Watching her go back and forth between the two states was truly surreal. She told me that I didn't need to be scared and that they weren't going to hurt me. They just needed a ride. I nodded, and smiled, and continued to scream internally. The man seemed much older than she was, in his sixties, bald, with wisps of white hair, maybe her uncle or her father. He would only speak by giving turn-by-turn -turn directions, and would absolutely lose his shit at me if I changed so much as Elaine unexpectedly. As the neighbourhood deteriorated around us, I desperately scanned the roads for a police car on patrol. I would call attention to myself somehow, run a red light, honk, swerve at them, anything to draw attention, and I would be saved and no such luck. My passengers were becoming increasingly agitated and paranoid as we neared our destination. They could sense my fear because the woman began to play with my hair and stroke my cheek. Hey, don't be scared. I said we're not going to hurt you, you're such a nice girl. She cooed in my ear. You're so nice. Such a pretty girl. Holy shit, holy shit, the man chuckled. I see the Kruger across the street. But no. Turn left, they screamed at me, into the sketchiest apartment complex ever. My heart sank. This is how it ends. Raped or dead. Or both. They have me idle in the parking lot. And the guy gets out. I'ma be right back. Make sure she doesn't get out. We got more stops after this. Ah, hell no. The woman stays with me in the car. And the guy disappears into one of the units. This is obviously a drug deal. 
I idly wonder if I'm guilty of a crime now, an accessory to something. I wonder if they tried to get me to come and party with them later or some shit. Not gonna happen. I knew that if they got out of my car, it would be the beginning of the end. Once the man leaves, the woman spreads out the passenger seat. I think she's just making herself comfortable until her legs part suggestively. And she begins sexy slow dancing in my 2008 Toyota Corolla to my immortal by Evanescence. She looks over to me with the most lustful set of bedroom eyes. She bites her upper lip and her hand travels up her thigh. And she asks me, do you like what you see? Is this really happening? Did she just proposition me while sexy dancing to Evanescence? As if this night could not get more bizarre. Luckily, my poker face is strong and I suppress any reaction. I break into an apologetic smile. Oh no, but thank you. I don't swing that way. I hastily switch one of my everyday rings to my wedding finger and hold it up with a regretful smile. I'm married, you see. My husband is expecting me home soon. Her seductive demeanour drops like a curtain, her face twisting with fury and indignation. Uh, what do you think I am, some kind of hooker? It wasn't like that, I didn't mean it like that. Oh no no no, I didn't think that at all, I'm sorry, I'm just very tired because I worked all day and it's late. She stares at me hard, eyes wide, and struggling to focus until her face breaks into another wide manic smile. She slumps back into her chair, seemingly satisfied with my answer, and we share an uncomfortable silence. I had to do something. No way I was going to see how this night played out, with me and the two of them. My eyes dart to the unit the man went into, and I lean over to the woman, my face can mask a concern. Hey, He's been gone a long time. Do you think you should go check on him, make sure he's okay? Her eyes narrow, suspicious, and she gives me a wary smile. You won't just drive away? I summon every ounce of angelic calm and poured it into my voice. Of course not. Y you promise? Yes. I smiled warmly. I promise dying a little more inside. Imagine my surprise when it actually worked. I watch her get out of the car and close the door. I book it. Rubber screeching, heart pounding. It's dark so I don't bother looking back. I try leaving the complex but there's only one exit. The way that we came in. Which is right where I dropped them off. I pulled into a random parking spot several buildings away and turned off my car. I ducked in my seat. I should have called the police then and there, but I didn't think I was out of the woods just yet. But I was safe, ish. But I called a friend and broke down in tears explaining everything over the phone. Once the adrenaline had worn off, I started my car back up. No sign of anyone watching the gate or looking for me. I make a getaway and arrive home safely about half an hour later. I called the police, and an officer was sent over to take my statement. I didn't expect anything to come of it, but I wanted the event on record in case there was retaliation. They knew where I worked because of my uniform, which also had my name prominently displayed as well as the car I drove. The officer asked me where I ended up taking them, and from my vague description, he instantly knew the location. High crime area. Lots of drug related incidents. Great. I still drive that 2008 Corolla. My next car will have electric locks. Number 5. I took a bunch of molly with some first timers on a rafting trip. Once we stopped at a beach, I realised people may have taken too much. A couple of chicks were shivering and in general not having a good time. I sat there with them until the shakes passed, but I realised how messed up we were, and something really bad could happen. 
out in the middle of nowhere, with no phones. Really dumb idea. Later that day, someone we were with took acid for the first time, did a couple lines of painkillers, and started overdosing in front of me. I had taken some acid at that point, and not really in the best mind, but everyone else I was with was all like, he's fine, he's fine. I know an OD when I see one, so I called 911, even though his wife pleaded with me not to. They came, and had to hit him twice with narsin, and took him to a local hospital, and ended up transferring him to a bigger hospital. Overall, just a really messed up experience, and really made me rethink my drug use. I used to be super safe with drugs, but then I got sloppy for a few years, and I'm back to being pretty good about everything. Pretty good. Number 6 My friends and I were driving at 3am, and we were acting like a bunch of middle school kids and huffing duster. For the record, I advised against my dumbass friends who was driving to do it. But they insisted, and the dumbass in front of me hands him the can, and he inhales it. About 30 seconds later, I hear, Watch out! I look up, and see us going straight towards a guardrail, the end part going around 80 miles an hour. As I prepare myself for death, we collide going at this speed and flip about six times before the car finally stops. I look up and see both their heads hanging and the car is slightly on fire in the engine and the friend in front of me is a big dude. I mean, he's about 300 pounds. Next thing I know, he jumps out the window and leaves me in the back with the door jammed. So I'm screaming for his dumb ass to come back but he's screaming and sprinting away. It was probably the quickest I've ever seen anybody run. My other friend crawls out as well, and we finally manage to crawl out of a window and run away. Luckily, the only serious injury any of us had was a broken shoulder that my larger friend had to suffer with. I only had a small seatbelt burn on my neck, which I thanked God for. I learnt my lesson that night about irresponsibility, that shit had me hooked up for quite a bit. But I'm thankful that nobody was hurt. It was quite selfish of all of us, even the two of us who weren't driving, to be doing that shit. I will never touch shitty duster again. Number 7 My mum did a lot of drugs when I was young. She was always pretty open about it. So drug use was a pretty normalised thing to my brain at a young age. Part of the normalisation occurred when my mum often took me with her on her drug runs. The dealers were always nice to me. One guy named DJ or PJ or something like that, and he had cool black light paintings and candle wax sculptures. Another guy called Don, and he had the biggest, bushiest beard I'd ever seen. Reminded me a lot of a brunette Santa Claus trucker. And then, there were Barbara and Sparky. Like the others, Barbara and Sparky were nice to me for the most part. Barbara was at least. Sparky usually just sat in his living room, watching movies on Cinemax and HBO. They were at least 20 years older than my mum. Maybe even 30. Whenever we'd go over... The routine was the same. My mum and Barbara would leave me in a room, and then they'd go get high. I was about seven at the time, so I was too naive to understand that this was wrong. But the room they left me in had a TV and a Nintendo Entertainment System, and at least 50 games for it. So I was in heaven. I played well-known games like Mario Bros, Bubble Bobble, as well as bizarre games forgotten in history like Monster Party and Kickle Cubicle. Regardless, I had hours of free time to explore the largest NES library I had ever seen. I was on Cloud 9. 
early on to our trips to Barbara and Sparky's though, my mum told me not to be alone with Sparky. I asked why, and she hesitated. She ended up just telling me that he didn't like kids, and I was innocent enough to buy into it despite her squirreliness. Despite the warning, I never noticed anything off about Sparky. Like I said earlier, he mostly just watched movies in the dark by himself. However, one night was a bit different. I was playing games as usual when the door opened. In the doorway was Sparky, holding a small glass of dark liquid, probably rum or whiskey. I said hi, but he just stood in the doorway staring at me. It was uncomfortable, but I turned back to my video game. I felt him stare at me for a few moments before I turned around again, and this time, he asked me what I was playing. I answered, and then we went back to silence and stares. He followed up by taking another swig of what he was drinking, and inching behind me. He put his hand on my shoulder and gave it a squeeze. Not like he was trying to get my attention, but something more purposeful. I didn't know what to make of it at the time, but thankfully, I didn't have much of a chance. Almost as if summoned by Sparky touching me, my mum and Barbara appeared in the doorway, surprised and concerned that Sparky was in the same room as me. They ushered him off, and the rest of the time my mum's drug dealer place was as normal as could be expected. I didn't know about paedophiles then, but now I do, and I wonder how close I came to being abused. On another visit to Barbara and Sparky's, I'd been playing video games for a lot longer than usual, and got hungry. I went into the kitchen and found nobody. I looked around for snacks on the counter, but only found a mirror with light wines of powder and a very short straw next to it. This was a strange sight to me as I had no idea what the powder was, never saw mirrors that small, and I definitely never saw straws that short. I stood there looking at it for a while, trying to make sense of it, when my mum came in behind me. She seemed hurried, and got a glass of ice water, and told me to stay away from the white powder, and to go back to playing games. Then as quickly as she entered, she left. I was still hungry, and she left so quick I wasn't able to ask her about food, so I followed her. She went to Barbara and Sparky's bedroom where Barbara was lying on the bed. She looked like she was having a bad dream, but her eyes were wide open. Her head thrashed about and was muttering. Something about Sparky and Christmas. She went on like that for a few minutes, and as a young child, I thought she was being funny, so I laughed about it. My mum's face just grimaced, gave Barbara the cold water, and told me to leave because Barbara wasn't feeling well. On the way home, I asked her about what she said. The Christmas man. I asked if it was Santa Claus, and if it was, why she was talking about him in the summer. I don't remember what she told me, she probably just dodged the questions or spoon-fed something that an innocent child would believe. My mum ended up breaking ties with Barbara and Sparky not long after that. I never knew why though, but I wasn't sad to never see them again. I was sad that I never got to play those video games again though. Number 8 I used to be prescribed Ambien, and would get a bottle of 30 10 milligrams every month. This was a pretty bad point in my life, and I was going off the deep end with drugs a bit. Something in my brain changed whilst on Ambien, and once I sniffed three or more, I would basically black out, and continue to snort them one after the other. One time I refilled my script, and woke up with the bottle empty, and I found two or three soggy ones around the house and would suck the coating off before I crushed them. That means I did about 27 pills in 8 hours. I woke up, freaked out, and stopped filling the script. Don't know how I didn't die. 
Number 9 A few weeks ago, my boyfriend was running late to work, so instead of dropping me off at my work, he dropped me off at the metro station next to his work. There's a stop that's only a few minutes away from campus, so I wasn't worried about it. As I'm waiting for the train at the stop, a random person thanks me for my service. I'm caught off guard, but realised that I had my military backpack on, complete with my last name stitched on. A man covered in face tattoos and wearing dirty, smelly clothes overhears and walks over to me as well. Oh, you're in the military? My wife is too. She's the exposition for Y unit. Actually, you look really familiar. Were you at the holiday parties at the racetrack? The specifics check out, but I definitely don't remember a guy with face tattoos showing up at that event. I tell him that I might know her, but that it's a big unit. The train comes, and I walk on and take my seat. Smith? Amanda Smith, I do recognise you. I turn around, and it's face tattoo man. He knows my whole name and decides to sit down next to me on the train. He starts asking me questions about my job, and asks me how his wife is doing. He says that she was feeling stressed out with her job, and that she was worried she was going to be fired. I thought it was a little weird considering that she had been fired over a week prior, but maybe he was trying to be polite and not embarrass her. But then, he started asking some strange questions. Where do we go for off-site training? When do we go? And when is the next time I train with her? I realised something was really wrong, and I get off at the next stop to try and get away from this guy, and he gets off the train too. Let's go together, you never answered my questions, he says. I look for my phone to call someone to get myself out of this situation, and I realise that I left it in my boyfriend's car. I decide to tell him I got off at the wrong stop, and try to get on a different car than him when the next train arrives. As if. He gets off the car and just gets onto mine at the next stop. He starts threatening me about giving him information about her. So I stand up and start making a scene, saying that I need help. A man intervenes and I get off at the next stop, which actually is my stop. I contact the woman and it turns out that since the holiday party, he had started doing heroin and became violent towards her. She and the kids moved out to an undisclosed location, and he tried abducting them at least once. He has been homeless, so that explains why I didn't recognise him at all. He did recognise me from the party, and was trying to figure out when she would next be around. She had a restraining and no contact order against him, so she encouraged me to contact the police if this ever happened again. I decided to not take the train anymore and ditch my backpack altogether. Last week I was working late, and decided to walk over the train stop to get some food. As I'm waiting to cross the crosswalk, I hear, Amanda? Good to see you. I look behind me, and face tattoo guy is standing there. No, no, no. Let's not meet and have dinner together as you try to figure out how to kidnap your wife. I turn and take off sprinting down the busy road to get away. I'm definitely staying away from the whole line now. Forever. Number 10 I was to have a small operation done on my stomach, and my parents being both surgeons, albeit the wrong type for this case, were also in the operation room. I remember the mouth spray, the tubes and my nose counting down from 10, to about four, and then apparently I turned around to my anesthesiologist lady and said, Wow, this is some quality shit. Who is your dealer? You must introduce us, and passed out. My mum thought it was funny, my dad didn't. Number 11 Let me start off by saying that I'm a single gay male. 
so naturally I use apps like Grinder and Growler. Well, one night, I got a message on Grinder from a local guy by the names of Byboy, saying that he sees me all the time, which was kind of creepy to begin with, since the profile picture was just a tongue sticking out and no noticeable features. Not two days later, I get another message asking if I smoked weed, to which I replied, yeah, sometimes and he invited me over to his apartment in our complex to smoke, to which I accepted. Everything started off innocent enough. Conversation, smoking, although it seemed he was already high from before I got there, and judging on how much he was giggling at little things. As the night goes on, he tells me that I need to take the weed with me, because it was mine, that I told him to buy it for me, which I didn't, and I argued the fact that he offered, that no mention of buying ever occurred. We sort of argued for a little while, so just to shut him up, I told him that I would give him $40 the next day after work. Later that night after I left, he proceeds to text me that I need to give him the money, or he's going to bring the weed over, or take it to my job. Again, I told him that I'd bring in the 40 the next day, and this continued several times until the next day. By now, he's getting on my nerves. Meanwhile, I'm telling him that I can't have the weed, nor do I want it, and just to give it to someone or whoever. So after work, I get the money. He tells me that I have to help him pay off his traffic ticket that he got, because he went to give the weed to someone but got pulled over for not using a signal. So now he's telling me that I have to give him 160 because he can't have a ticket, because he's trying to get custody of his kids, which, looking on it now, I doubt was even a factor. So I get another 140 to give him. By now, the traffic ticket has gone up to 200, which sends up red flags, and I told him I couldn't, nor wouldn't pay it. To be perfectly clear, I was not giving him money to help him out, but out of self-defense to get him away from me, since I didn't know what to expect in case he was dangerous. I had to backpedal my steps and tell him I lied about where I lived and worked, just so that he wouldn't get involved. But truthfully, I was glad I never gave him my name or got his. He didn't have much to go on besides my physical description, and I was afraid that he'd try and find my apartment by asking around, which is exactly what happened. I quickly hid in the bedroom closet whilst my roommate answered the door, and told him they hadn't seen who he was looking for. I quickly called my boss, and told him a very condensed version of the story, and told him if someone comes looking for me who doesn't know my name and just knows what I look like, that I don't work there, and that they don't know me. Then I get a barrage of texts asking if I have his cell phone from at least five different numbers. So I know they're all him, which is even more suspicious. I didn't reply to any of these, so eventually they stopped. But now I'm scared to leave the apartment except for work. That crazy drug pushing stalker might still be out there. And I really hope I don't meet him again. Number 12. This is about my ex-boyfriend from about 10 years ago. He was an alcoholic, which I knew about, but he hid his pill addiction from me. One night, we were partying at a friend's house. He is really messed up on Xanax and drank the better part of a bottle of Macca's Mark. Our friends are slightly more responsible than him and offered to drive us home in his car and I was only about 15 at the time. I know, I was a winner. My friends and his two friends are in the car with us. His sober friend is driving, and my ex cannot stop talking shit about his friend driving, and provoking him for no reason. His friend gets fed up, pulls over on the highway, and the three guys are now out of the car, two of them about to fight, and one trying to stop it. 
I'm in the car with my friend, and we're both scared. My ex manages to wrangle the keys from his friend, and then he proceeds to run into the car and hop into the driver's seat and go. He left his two best friends on the side of the interstate at 3am, with no phones and very far away from the next exit. My friend and I are in the back seat crying, and hold hands just knowing we are going to be killed in the car. My ex dropped us off at my house 20 miles away. Needless to say, I broke up with him the very next day, and he adamantly denied it all. He's a better person now, and spent a year in prison for trying to run someone over in his car whilst messed up. That really straightened him out. He's got kids with someone he cares about now, and I'm proud he turned his life around. Bonus. I had been drinking beers and was getting too drunk for my taste. Tired as well, it had been a long day, so I pulled out my bag of MDMA, opened it, and started shaking some of it into my beer. When my friend looks at me and says, But that's MDMA. I'm not sure, but I think we were talking about LSD at that moment. I smile and tell him, Yeah, obviously whilst I kept shaking the stupid bag. I realised I put in a bit too much, but I figured I'd just not drink the last bit. Next thing I remember is the rancid taste of the last bit of beer, with too much MDMA in it. I remember thinking, oh boy, here we go. Next thing I know, I wake up from a muscle spasm in my car with no recollection of what happened. I don't feel too bad or tired, I just get out and head back to the party. My friends are just grinning and told me that absolutely everybody noticed. No one ever told me what the hell I did that night, but I'm sure it was pretty crazy. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment as it would really help me out. Thanks guys. If you want your story read on my channel, you can submit it as a text post to Reddit or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. And if you would like to do something truly amazing today to help support the channel, you now can via Patreon. For more information, you can find a link in the description, as well as the links to my social media pages. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.